Welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm very excited to share my interview with author Matt Haig. His latest book, The Midnight Library, will be released in the United States in just a few short weeks on September 29th. One of the things that Matt touches on in our conversation is how important acceptance is to the writing process. We also go on a few tangents involving a film we both love, which is It's a Wonderful Life, and, and that really does deal with acceptance as one of its core themes. And for those of you familiar with that movie, you know that George Bailey is this character who has, you know, he's got a lot of resentment in his life. He's a guy who wanted to travel. He wanted to explore the world, but is kind of prevented from doing so after the death of his father. And so he goes, you know, into his father's uh, defunct, now defunct, uh, savings and loan business. They, they don't really have savings and loans uh, anymore here. Um, but back in uh, in the day when this movie was made, savings and loan business was a uh, was a real thing. And what George does is he helps regular people live the American dream. And then all of a sudden, his uncle loses some money, his nemesis finds it, he keeps it. And then George realizes that, you know, he's really up a creek without a paddle and feeling as if the world would be a better place if he wasn't in it. He attempts to take his own life. And this is not, you know, a podcast about it's a wonderful life. And there's a lot more to the story. But the point is, the point is, we all know George Bailey's out there. We all have George Bailey's in our lives. And sometimes, sometimes we even feel like George Bailey. And I know I do. I had big dreams when I was younger. I wanted to go to graduate school. I wanted to earn a PhD in psychology. But uh, things have a, a way of changing, you know, what I... What I wound up doing was uh, going into the business world after leaving my undergraduate uh, studies. I got married very young. Uh, subsequently, I had three kids by the time I was 27 years old. We have triplets, for those of you who don't know. And I never went back to get my PhD. I thought about it many times. I even applied uh, to Columbia, got in, got into their uh, PhD program, and uh, had to pass it up. It just really wasn't practical. It really wasn't practical for... Uh, a father of three I was probably 28, 29 at the time when I had the, the big idea to, to try and go back to school. Um, it just wasn't a practical thing to do. We, we wouldn't have been able to, to make rent, so to speak, or pay the mortgage. It, I guess it's more, um, more accurate. Anyway, uh, you know, that was one of the things that I d used to dwell on a lot. It's one of the things that I had regrets about. And I, I realized I carried around a lot of resentment about that uh, for a long time. But, you know, that's that's not the only place where I had resentment or kind of a lack of acceptance in, in my own life, if you will. Uh, I also had resentment towards my twin brother, Jimmy, uh, who I love more more than anything in the world. But um, you know, when we were kids, he, he got a lot more attention than I did, uh, and primarily because he was always sick. He was also very angry. I'm sure there was a, 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 some kind of link between the two. Um, but I was always the kid who was expected to be happy so that when I was upset about something, it was kind of a big deal. Like if Mike wasn't happy, um, people noticed and they they wondered why. And it was often dismissed. You know, I, I would I would go to, um, you know, my mother or father with something and, and they invariably say, offer it up to the souls of purgatory, Michael. Um, and for those of you who are not Catholic or who might be lapsed Catholics or who have just, you know, forgotten everything about uh, your catechism, uh, purgatory is this place where people go after they die, after they die to cleanse themselves of their sins prior to going to heaven. So, I mean, leave it to Catholics to really complicate death, um, you know, even further. <laughs> um but if you think about it, you know, I go to my parents about something I'm upset about, and instead of them trying to help me or comfort me and me being a living, breathing person, I'm told to offer it up for the soul of somebody who's already dead. And that's interesting. The point about all this is I, I resented I resented these things, you know, and I didn't realize um, that I was resenting these things, and I didn't realize uh, the toll it was taking on me uh, in my adult life. And, you know, with some help, I've, I've come to accept these things and I no longer carry around this baggage. Um, but the thing is, and, and you'll hear it in, in my conversation with Matt, you know, coming to an acceptance of these things brings insights 
into your life. And the insights that I have that I've been able to uncover, excavate is a term I like to use, has actually helped my writing because it helps me understand the human condition that much more. And uh, with these insights, I can find new ways to make the human condition relatable through characters that I develop. Um, so apologies for that tangent, but it, that, that kind of really came to me after my conversation with, uh, with Matt. Now, the theme of Matt's new book is uh, also something that really intrigues me. And, and, and you know, the, the idea kind of centers around, you know, what if there were this place where you could see how different versions of your life played out based on making different decisions. It's in a very intriguing idea, and I, I can't wait to dig into the book. Um, you know, for example, what would have happened if I did go and, and get my doctorate in psychology? Would I be happier now? You know, what, what would my life um, have become? I, I don't know, but I'm, I'd be curious to find out. Um, what, what would my life uh, have been like if I went to a different college? Um, that one hits really close to home because college is where I met my wife. And if I didn't go there, you know, I wouldn't uh, have my wife. I wouldn't have the three kids who uh, I love more than anything in the world right now. Uh, so clearly this interview <laughs> evoked a lot of thoughts in me. And I hope it does the same for you. Um, so without any further commercial interruptions or ramblings from a future soul of purgatory, here is my conversation with Matt Haig. I've got a couple um, playing, having them and playing them are, are kind of two different things um, in my life anyway. So yeah. I don't make enough time for it. Are, are, are yeah, you? I've got, I've got, uh, where are my guitars? They, oh, they've been moved. They're, they're over there. Uh, yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, there you can see. Oh, I see the headstocks. There they are. My son can play. My uh, my twelve year old son, he plays. But um, no, I, I I'm not very good at guitar. I have yeah. been learning piano this um, lockdown. When we had the lockdown, I was we got an app called Simply Piano. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's so good if you've got a keyboard. It actually genuinely made it like playing a game or something. It was it was it was pretty cool. So that's how that's how I, I've killed a lot of 2020 by just getting better up to speed with my uh playing bohemian rhapsody that was it was building towards bohemian rhapsody that's good well that's a, it's a wonderful song um did you see the movie did you see uh yeah i did i liked it i liked it i preferred i preferred the elton john one did you see rocket man you know my wife has i have not uh, that's on my list of things to, to, yeah, to no, I, thought, I, I felt there was some more sort of truth to that but no i had a blast with the um bohemian rhapsody it was he, a he, was, he was great the um What's his name? Rami, Rami Malek, yeah. yeah. So I guess just to, to start off, um, again, because we, we always like to like understand kind of what, what makes people tick, but kind of starting in childhood, when, when you were growing up, just kind of paint a picture for me of, of what your life was like growing up and, and where you grew up, what your parents did, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, um, we moved about quite a bit. I mean, I grew up in England. I, I, predominantly from the age of eight to 18, I was in a town called Newark, which is very different to your Newark, New Jersey, or any of your other Newarks in the States. It's a very small place. Um, it's 30,000, maybe 40,000 population now. But it was the archetypal small town you wanted to escape um, when I was uh, growing up. It, it's got a lot better, I have to be fair. Um, but it, at the time, it had no cinema, it had no bookshop. It was culturally quite a wasteland. It was predominantly a working class town. I was kind of a bit of a middle class fish out of water. My mum was a teacher. My dad was an architect, so I suppose I was middle class. But I went to a very working class school. Um, it wasn't, I had one um, male friend who actively read and was into books, but gen generally it was kind of, you know, it wasn't really the thing um, in my school to be a teenage boy who liked books, which is very sad. And I'm sure there's still many schools like that, but um, it was kind of almost like a, a, a guilty secret. I mean, me, me and my friend, Jonathan, we used to exchange Stephen King's and um, various other horror authors and things like that. But um, yeah, beyond that, it wasn't, it, 
everything was quite downwardly mobile. You know, I, no, no one really in my year went to university. Um, you know, things like Oxford and Cambridge universities, they were like another world. You know, I didn't, I didn't even know anyone really actually went to them. And so it wasn't, you know, I, to fit in, especially as I was kind of like the, uh, the middle class kid. I mean, I'm, I, as soon as I got to London and out of that, I realized I wasn't really posh. I wasn't like a posh English person. Um, but at school, I was considered relatively posh just because because my parents had jobs and, you know, doing. so I was very downwardly mobile to kind of fit in. It wasn't a school where people were wanting to get the best grades. Or, you know, it was more like just sort of like you would be better off being a petty criminal or, you know, shoplifting or, you know, drinking, taking drugs. And, you know, I doubled in a few of those things for my sins at that time as a teenager. Um, and so, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the most promising um, place to grow up. But the one thing, as well as having very uh, supportive and uh, parents who were into culture and stuff, my mum's big thing was theatre and she used to drag me along to the theatre, which I never wanted to go to. Um, but, you know, and we had a house full of books. And the one thing Newark did have um, was a library in the uh, town centre and it was quite a modern library it wasn't like your sort of old world oldie worldy library it was it was like a large greenhouse it was sort of all glass it was quite a, it was in the 1980s it seemed really futuristic and it was a very light and welcoming um, space and because my parents both worked and worked late I'd, I would go to the library on an evening and I'd just sort of um, hang out there not necessarily reading but doing homework just killing time whatever and it, it, I think you know that you know just being surrounded by so many books getting access to things I wouldn't read um, really realizing there was more out there in terms of literature than um, my teachers or parents had been handing down to me and so that kind that kind of there's a place that opens up a lot of worlds to me plus I had a good English teacher called Mrs Kurzweil who encouraged me with my um, creative writing I had plucked up the co courage as this quite introverted um, 12 or 13 year old to show her some of my sort of fantasy stories and um, she gave me um, some confidence so yeah that's that's um, early days but yeah it wasn't um it wasn't that promising me as a teenager. If someone had said you will one day be a published author, that would have been like beyond anything. I would have, uh, you know, I, I, I had, I, it's not that I didn't have ambitions. I just had no confidence. You know, I had no, very low self-esteem. But back in those days, what did you want to be? Like, did you have a sense of what you wanted to be? If, I mean, clearly uh, maybe not an author, but. Well, when I was a bit younger, when I was like sort of 10 and 11, I'd heard somewhere um, of someone being a graphic designer. And I just, and I knew what it was. And my dad was an architect, so he was, he was into sort of design and stuff. And I just felt, you know, rather than say airline pilot or train driver, it sounded like a mature thing to say graphic designer. Whether I actively really wanted to be a graphic designer, I don't know. I would very much lived in um, the present tense, but not in a good mindful way, just in a sort of not thinking about um, the future very much. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I suppose I always knew I was a bit artsy, you know, I was always into movies and um, books and stuff. So that's where my interests were. But I didn't necessarily know what jobs, what paying work I would have been able to do. To be honest, it wasn't until my 20s, until I was 24, I, I you know, and I wrote about this in a book called um, Reasons to Stay Alive, which was a nonfiction book, but I had a full blown breakdown in my 20s. Um, in which I was suicidal for a few years and um, depressed. I was diagnosed with panic disorder. I, I went through the whole um, work, so I had the whole smorgasbord of uh, sort of mental turmoil. And then when I recovered from that, in a very weird sense, it actually, that experience gave me a kind of confidence because when I was really at rock bottom, it literally felt impossible to get um, to a better place, to, to recover. And then, so when I did recover, it felt like I'd done something that was impossible. So in a weird way, that gave me the, uh, not courage, but the sort of belief, the self-belief that I could do something um, that where the odds were against me. So, you know, when I started out um, writing my first novel, trying to get an agent, all of that stuff, 
I was almost in a mentality where I was welcoming rejection. Well, mm-hmm. I, I was kind of like, I was so, because it was, it, because it was part of the process, um, I was just pleased I was in the process. I was pleased that literary agents were noticing me, even if they were just rejecting me. So it was a very strange, I don't think if I was starting now, to be honest, I'd, have a, I'd be a bit more vulnerable and a bit more thin skinned about it. But my, I didn't go on any sort of writing courses or anything. The, the, the closest thing was some of these agents would get back and, and they'd see something in it, but they'd have a criticism. And I'd take those criticisms on board. And that that would be, you know, that was my kind of creative writing course. And I, I you know, I'm one of those stories of first people had loads and loads and loads of, uh, of rejections. So I genuinely think a key part of getting on the ladder is that sort of resilience and that kind of like trying even though writing is very personal obviously trying once you've completed the work to try and have some you know to try and not have too much personal attachment to it I know that sounds like a contradiction because you are are putting yourself in it but you, you need a kind of business hat which you have as soon as you step outside it so you you kind of need especially nowadays i think you kind of need two selves you kind of need the artist creative side and then you need the pragmatic um side and you uh, both are kind of equally important in terms of getting published i i I very much believe but i never compromise what i'm writing i still always write for me i don't write for the market whatever the market is because I could not through any sort of like pretentiousness but I just don't know how to mind read other people so I just have to write a book that I want to read you know and and but beyond that afterwards yeah I've got no shame in going out there and you know trying to sell my work and being you know being quite thick-skinned about it well that that, that's why you're here right so um I want to go back to something you said and, and 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 it has to do with um you know, your first book, Reasons to Stay Alive, and I know that's nonfiction, and I know that came from a, a place of um, maybe light after some darkness, but it, I, was, I was listening to an interview this morning by Ice-T. I'm going to assume you know who Ice-T is, right? I and, used to have a poster on my wall in Newark on Trent. I had Ice-T, original gangster, staring down. Anyway, come on. Well, there you go. So, yeah, <laughs> but he was saying, you know, he, was, he, was, he said... Um, and I know this quote has has been said by many other people, but he said it to me this morning, not to me, but to my yeah. ears. Uh, he said, um, some of the best art comes from pain. Some of the best art comes from pain. And when I was looking into your background and, and you know, seeing what your first book um, yeah. was, I could I, I thought to myself that this this guy probably knows that. Right. Yeah, well, it's absolutely true. I mean, I think I think, you know, there are obviously exceptions to that. And I don't think that you have to you have to, you know, put yourself into positions that are traumatic in order to become an artist. I think you've either got that sensibility or haven't. But definitely there's another quote I like. Um, There's a a British writer who I studied at university, Graham Greene. He said that like a, a miserable childhood is the bank a writer keeps drawing on like forever. And I wouldn't say I had a miserable childhood. There was no, you know, I was never locked in the attic. I, my parents were good people. I've got a great relationship with my parents. I, I didn't, have, there's no sort of inciting incident, which, um, you know, formed any kind of pain, even though I had depression, I just think that was a kind of thing that would have happened to me anyway. But yeah, I, I when I'm writing and I'm trying to get ideas, but it does tend to come from the more darker, the depressing places. And definitely in my case, I don't think I would be a writer, at least not the writer I am and be interested in things I write about without having gone through that. And I, I think there's two aspects to that. Firstly, just because, as I said before, it kind of gave me that confidence that, like I, I I could do anything in, in one sense, but I, in another sense, there was a practical thing where I, when I was really ill, I, w- I was actually, I was, I was such a mess at one point that to leave the house, I would have a panic attack. I was full blown agoraphobic for a little while. And um, so, you know, and, and in debt. So I literally couldn't go out and have a nine to five office job at that point in time even though I'd had that before. And so I needed to actually um, 
do something from home which could potentially pay and obviously the first thing I didn't do was, was write a novel but it was um, try and get into freelance journalism um, this was around the start of a millennium 2000 sort of time and um, I discovered early on at that point um, if you wanted to get into journalism, the thing to write about was technology and the internet and stuff like that, because that was a very burgeoning thing then. It was very easy as a 24-year-old in the year 2000 to present yourself as someone who, who's who got some authority about the internet, because basically it was such a new thing. Anyone could be an expert on the internet. If, you, if you'd sent an email in, in 2000, you were an expert on the internet, you know, if it was, uh, if you'd use Google. So um, if you had a Hotmail account, you, you were there. So I, uh, I did that for a while. And I don't think that was quite important. Not, you know, I wasn't writing anything I was super interested in. It was very much just a job. But I think it gave me, um, got me used to writing for Deadline. It got me used to sort of seeing my name in print, which gave me a bit of confidence that I, I it made me feel like, oh, I'm a writer. And um, so I, I feel that time, uh, although it was very hard for me still mentally and it was hard for us still financially, it got, got us on the sort of path. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 um, I think about it too, just, just my own writing and just kind of dealing, you know, you mentioned that, that quote about, um, you know, an unhappy childhood is, is um, I'm, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but, uh, and I didn't have an unhappy childhood either. I mean, I had, I had great parents, great family, but there, there is pain. And, and like many of us, you know, I, I have my own dark times and I would look to writing as a way of having some kind of control over a world. And even being able to kind of like create a world that I thought may be a little bit better or more interesting. Um, and it is a very solitary thing. And, and I think you have to be able to embrace the idea of kind of being alone while, while you yeah, do yeah. it. Um, and then to me, I write, you know, I, in addition to writing, you know, novels, I do stand up comedy. So that for me is taking like my deepest dark thoughts, turning them into something comedic. And then having power over, you know, that, that fear, you know, having power, yeah. it gives you power over that fear, that terror, whatever it is. To what, make do you feel, what do you feel like one minute before you're going out there? Do you have that total oh terror? My gosh. I mean, I, it's terrifying, terrifying. No matter how many times I do it, I, I am scared to death. And in addition to, you know, yeah. That, that side of me, I, I run group interviews for a living with, um, you know, for marketing purposes. And, and I've done thousands of these group interviews with strangers. And right before the first session, I will always have those butterflies that that pit in my stomach that, oh, my God, something is going to go wrong. I said, yeah. this is going to be bad. My clients are going to hate me. But then it, it, it all turns out fine. It's just it's just that little, you know, yeah. stupid critic in your head that is just won't shut the hell up sometimes. but. I used to be dreadful, like when I was a sort of debut author doing the first book events, I'd be one of those writers, I, you know, you'd see this sort of shake and um, all of that. And it's took me years, but I mean, last year was a big moment for me because I actually opted to do a solo tour rather than have someone on stage interviewing me, I to actually just go out and be myself uh, for an hour and then take questions from the audience and in some quite big venues. And um, yeah, that was that was a very cathartic, not easy, but I was very sort of proud of myself for having done that because because for me, public speaking was mm. even before I was diagnosed with any mental health conditions. Public speaking was like, yeah, it's, I, I found it the worst when I was younger, but I I kind of almost like it now. So. Yeah, it it you know I I I derive energy like I get the secret is to to find a way to derive energy from the people and. Um, you know, for you know, when I do comedy, that's that's what it's all about. And you can feel you can feel when the energy turns, and you can feel when it's poor. You can feel when it's good. It's funny, my father, you know, because he he would see me, you know, doing all these public type things, and he'd be like, you know, he, he spent forty five years at American Express, and he got to be a pretty senior level guy. He used to have to be in front of groups of people all the time, and he told me he would get so scared, he would pop a Valium before before going up in front of like this huge meeting. And I'm like, I, I had no idea that he was on drugs at one point in time. <laughs> but um, yeah. 
I've had Valium as well. And it's, it's kind of, you know, and it's not always the best um, thing to have in your system if you're trying to sort of remember things and to be, you know, look like you're being sharp. But or I if you like vodka gimlets, uh, which I think he found out the hard way. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, you know, so your first, the first book, Reasons to Stay Alive, obviously nonfiction. Um, when did you decide to make the jump from nonfiction to fiction? And kind of what, what was that like? And were there any other kind of like, hurdles you had to jump through when when you made that change yeah well I mean I'd written fiction before um reasons to stay alive and really to be honest I feel like every book is different unless you're writing a series or it's a, a an overt sequel to something almost every book feels like a debut in some sense I mean reasons to stay alive felt new but then what followed uh, what after reasons to stay alive the first thing i wrote after reasons to stay alive was a children's book it was a children's book which they're making into a film actually um and it's called a boy called christmas and it's about um santa as a boy and um that i did that because it literally felt like the most opposite thing to writing about depression and a breakdown i was literally trying to just write something that just totally cheered me up and so often I will do that. I will swing. I'll almost go in the opposite direction. And I've had to have some sort of like little battles with publishers to, you know, because publishers, if you do one thing and it's done quite well, they will want you to keep doing that one thing. Um, but I fought a few battles early on. So now I'm in a lucky position where I can switch between children's books, adult fiction, adult nonfiction. And so I've got sort of like three things going on. I mean, I see myself primarily as a fiction writer. But in the UK, um, my most successful book um, up until the Midnight Library, Midnight Library's done um, really well. Um, but up, up until that point was um, Reasons to Stay Alive. So I was always sort of known as like Mr. Depression and, you know, that thing. And I was like, just wanted to sort of shake off um, that. And that kind of gave me a motivation, really, um, to, to keep going. Not that I resent writing Reasons to Stay Alive, because, you know, it's been useful to people, and it was useful to me to get all that stuff out there. But, um, yeah, I, I, I feel in my heart of hearts, the writing I enjoy doing most is making stuff up. You know, it, it's sort of making a world up, making people come to life who aren't actual people and it's, it's the closest we're going to get to going into parallel universes isn't it to actually um create worlds we want to create and you know i think you know me having sort of low level anxiety all the time i think um having control and command over your your own daydreams that you're putting out on the page is very calming and very um therapeutic yeah yeah, no, it's um, you know, for me, it's uh, it's it's cathartic. You know, it's 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 not even just therapeutic. It's being able to, you know, I I have a lot of inhibitions in 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 my daily life, and but when I'm when I'm getting into the head of a character, I can have them say things that I want to say, but I'm too afraid to. You know, I yeah. can I can kind of you know, and I can work through, I can work through them. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why I love you know, writing fiction and, you know, it's, um, it kind of, it kind of keeps me going, but I, I, I do want to talk about um, the Midnight Library because I just love the idea um, behind this, behind this book. So how, how would, you know, you, I mean, you're obviously the creator of it. So what, what is the big idea behind the Midnight Library and, and how did it come to you? Right. Well, the Midnight Library itself is a library which exists between life and death. Um, so there's this young woman called Nora who's in a, a despairing state of mind and she does something stupid and she ends up between life and death and um, the, she finds this library which looks like a, a relatively ordinary building from outside she heads towards it through the mist she's in the library and then she realizes it's infinite so the bookshelves go on forever all the books are this sort of different shades of green and um, there's a librarian there um, called Mrs. Elm, and um, this sort of godlike librarian. And basically, each book on the shelves is a different version of Nora's life if she had lived it a different way. And she can enter these lives simply by opening the book and starting to read. So I felt like a library was the perfect kind of 
setting for a portal to two other worlds because that's how it was for me when I was younger and you know a library I feel is such a sort of great symbol for um, parallel lives and parallel worlds because that's almost what a library or a bookshop is it's kind of like this place we enter where you know even if we haven't read most of the books, all those unread books are so sort of tantalizing, I think. And um, so, so Nora's full of regrets and she's suddenly able to undo her regrets and to see if she had made different decisions, um, if she'd have stayed um, with a certain man, if she had stayed in a rock band, if she had pursued a swimming career and potentially become an Olympic medalist. Um, if she'd stayed doing science at university and become a glaciologist in the Arctic Circle. She's got all these alternate um, lives. And as soon as I had the concept of the library, and I don't 100% remember the day I got that concept. I knew I wanted to do parallel lives for a long time. Um, and I was playing around for ages with some kind of library or books. There's a short story by... Um, uh, a South American writer, Borges, who um, wrote a book called The Library of Babel, which is about a, a magical library, which was very inspiring. It's not about parallel lives, but it's about lots, of, you know, almost every book that's ever been written and every version of every book. So I, I thought, you know, extending that idea to parallel lives, um, you know, would be so interesting emotionally to do that. And then, you know, another influence was um, It's a Wonderful Life, one of my favorite films, mm -hmm. um, to sort of have that, you know, which is which is a science fiction story, essentially, because it's about parallel lives. So there's all that kind of stuff in there. And it was just an opportunity for me to literally go anywhere, because as soon as you've got the concept of a multiverse and you've got a device um, you know, you have to work out a little bit the logic of it, you know, yeah. how, how long she can stay in that life, what happens when she leaves that life to the person she's left behind, all of that stuff. But to be honest, I was determined not to get too bogged down. One of my frustrations sometimes with science fiction when I'm reading science fiction is when it's almost over explains where, where it, you, you know, you can see that the person has worked it out. And they're so proud of having worked out the mechanics it almost becomes a scientific textbook and I wanted to remain true to the story and realize at the same time that this might not be possible and just sort of go with the daydream you know yeah. what I mean I, I, and, and not tie myself into knots by trying to say well this works because of x y or z and um yeah, that's it. yeah that, this idea of this this kind of place between life and death um to me, I mean, I grew up Catholic and, and you know, my mother always had this saying. It was, uh, if, I ever, if I was ever upset about something, she would always dismiss it <laughs> and, and very politely. But by yeah. saying, offer it up for the souls of purgatory. And purgatory is this like notion that, hey, before you get into heaven, you've got to be cleansed of whatever sins you had here. And I don't know why my mind kind of went there when you're talking about the Midnight Library, but I'm thinking to myself, wow, I wonder if like this whole purgatory thing could be like that, where, you know, you're not just reflecting on the life that you had, but maybe you're able to see the life that could have been. Um, I don't know. I just went really deep there, but that, that's, that's where that took me to. No, absolutely. And I, I feel like, you know, me, when I went through depression, I used to think about this a lot. Because obviously being like suicidal for a while, you, you, you philosophizing about life and death, but also I had so much regret. I had so much, it wasn't like I'd done particularly bad things or anything, but I, I mainly regretting that I'd got myself into this mess, this mental mess. And I, I, I thought if only I'd lived my life a different way, or if I lived it a way where I got more confidence or I'd lived it in a healthier way where I'd never drank alcohol or smoked or done all these things. And, you know, I was just swamped with all these things and wishing I could have done, done, done things and done things differently. And kind of like my recovery uh, was kind of like about acceptance, you know, learning to accept that. And Nora's journey in the novel is a journey towards acceptance and to understand that what we think is the greener grass isn't always the greener grass and every life you know there's no there's no utopia on earth where you are happy every single day and everything is perfect it doesn't matter if you've got a billion dollars it doesn't matter if you're internationally famous megastar it doesn't matter who you are or where you are what sort of relationship you're in. there's always 
problems. You know, that's it's human life, you know, contains problems, it contains grief, it contains issues that we have to deal with. And we can insulate ourselves from some things, but, you know, we're, we're always vulnerable. And that's, that is on one hand scary, but on one hand, it's sort of like miraculous. And it's kind of like that uncertainty of life is also what gives us hope. And so I wanted to take this person who was kind of depressed, I wanted to take this library where, you know, you've got infinite choice and tr try and weave a story of optimism and acceptance out of this kind of unpromising start of this suicidal young woman. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 there are some hints of George Bailey in there, aren't there? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing people forget about It's a Wonderful Life is it's actually quite dark. You know, there's a lot of darkness, not just at the beginning, all the way through It's a Wonderful Life, right to the end. And, um, you know, it was, it was groundbreaking at the time in terms of what it was talking about in terms of suicide, depression, alcoholism, all kinds of issues. There's a, there's a scene in It's a Wonderful Life where his employer um, hits the young George Bailey around the head, he's getting abused, all kinds of the issues are, are raised in that film. And yet it leaves you with this most triumphant, euphoric kind of feeling that, that you know, ordinary life is a miraculous thing. And that's what I, I wanted to do. And that's what I used to struggle with um, before I ever became depressed. You know, for me, for life to be good, it had to have the most, I had such a high bar of what I needed to have in terms of happiness. Um, I'm not talking in terms of material things and status. I just mean like in terms of experiences, I had to have the wildest nights out or watch the most intense movies or have the loudest sort of music. Everything was sort of, sort of intense and about escaping yourself and then after I recovered everything that I had found boring about life before suddenly you know I was just so grateful for I was so grateful for like neutrality and just sort of being rather than always having to do something or you know have the wildest time or whatever and that was the sort of that's how I sort of grew up I think in that recovery phase yeah I have to ask because I know you're a fan of the film um but uh, what's your take on Pottersville? Do you think it was like a more exciting place to live than Bedford Falls or, uh, you know? Um... Well, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, it, certainly it's more fun to watch Pottersville, definitely. And um, I feel like it's kind of Las Vegas, isn't it? Pottersville, basically yeah. Vegas, or certainly old Vegas. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to live in a world which was, um, totally devoid of that you know i got i'm someone who got married in las vegas and um i'm also someone who lived in ibiza in, in europe which is a sort of party island and i still like i still like a a late night out i still like um having cocktails and things like that so i don't want a totally puritanical existence so i would like to visit pottersville but i wouldn't want to necessarily live on the high street yeah you know? no I, I agree i was on a um i was on a radio show oh this is four or five years ago it was right around Christmas time. I was promoting a book um, that happened to have, uh, I was on a, it was on the Catholic channel on Sirius XM and a caller called in and uh, she mentioned something about it's a wonderful life. And I threw out there that, Hey, I'd like to spend some time in Pottersville. And like the, the entire room went silent. <laughs> like it was, this was just the wrong thing to say to this crowd. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's horrible. Um, no absolutely. yeah, exactly. But still, I, I, you know, what I take from uh, It's Wonderful Life isn't the rejection of Pottersville. It's more about that acceptance of, you know, what you think of as sort of the trivial things as actually being the important things. You know, the actual, you know, yeah. he, he felt like he was so restrained by life that actually he'd made such a difference to everybody. And I, I like that aspect of it without, without having to sort of like yeah. um, dismiss the odd wild night. Yeah. So now the Midnight Library is coming out. Um, when? When is uh, when is the release date for it? It is uh, U.S. release date is 29th of September. September 29th. Okay. So we got a few weeks to go. Um, so uh, what um, what what's next for you? I mean, I, I assume that you have you have something something in the works or some ideas being sketched out or. Um, well, next. Well, the very next thing that will appear will possibly be the film there's a film of my children's book a boy called christmas which was coming out next year on netflix so that will be happening um christmas 2021 um in terms of my writing i'm writing another non-fiction book 
um, called The Comfort Book, which is going to basically do what it says on the tin. It's just going to be things that comfort me. It's, it's a Wonderful Life will be in there. It's just going to be me just sort of um, talking about the concept of com comfort, things that comfort me. It's kind of be good. It's going to be very uh, like a sketchbook, and it's not going to be a, a, a narrative format. It's going to be like one of those books that you can just dip in anywhere. And I've never written written one of those. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Um, and maybe more children's books as well. But I, I definitely want to just return to writing um, fiction because I feel, yeah, as I say, I, I'm always happiest when I'm writing fiction. But I do not know what my next um, novel for adult people i don't know when that will be or what it will be we'll I'm, I'm curious about um the a boy called christmas and kind of kind of navigating the the screenwriting process and kind of going from you know doing the uh obviously the uh, the novel um novel version did you i mean were you also hired to write the screenplay as well and what what kind of involvement did you have with um with that part of the process well you know officially a very little you know I, my name will be on screen in terms of I wrote the book but I wasn't a screenwriter I did contribute to a couple of scenes you know when they were having problems and stuff um but basically no I I mean they asked me they asked me you know when it was at the contract stage about whether I wanted to be the screenwriter I sensed earlier on they didn't necessarily want me to say yes I've got to be the screenwriter and to be honest, at that point, I had, I'd had a year or maybe more than a year trying to adapt one of my um, books. It was a book I wrote, a science fiction book, which no one read, called Echo Boy. And it got options by a company who had big plans for it. And they wanted me to write it. And I spent a year writing it. And it was the most stressful year of my writing life being a screenwriter because... Unlike writing a novel where you just sort of, you go, you write the thing, you then, if you're getting published, you get an editor and then you go back and forth a bit. There were so many people involved as a producer, a director, different things. It never ended up happening. It felt like a, you know, it felt like a bit of a wasted year. And I, I so at the point when A Boy Called Christmas came out, I was very happy to just say no, um, let, let someone else write it the guy writing it um old parker is a very good screenwriter and he wrote it and he did a great job probably a better job than i could have done with it so i can actually enjoy it as a person looking forward to a film rather than a person who's got such, such ownership over it you know it, it's obviously based on my book but it's something quite different to my book and um yeah it's definitely took it in a direction i wouldn't have taken it but I think that's a good thing. You know, I think as, as long as you trust the people that you're handing over your work to, um, you don't want them to necessarily do exactly what you would do. You just want something good. And I think they're going to create something good. So. Yeah, that, that's it's similar to things I've heard, too. I, I interviewed um, Tess Gerritsen, who was a very prolific author, writes, um, wrote the Rizzoli and Isles series of books. And I asked her, I'm like, did you have anything to do with the, the TV show? And she's like, absolutely not. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it had to be a relief too because that's a, a different animal. And even though they changed many things about, um, you know, the the stories to fit, you know, the screen, um, you know, she was uh, kind of relieved. And and I've I've tried to like I, I have a couple of books where people have said that this really would make a great movie. So then I would sit down and try and write this, and I just it's a different. It's and no one. Yeah. People that have never tried to do it don't understand. They're like, why don't you just write a screenplay? I'm like, oh, why don't you just, you know, build an airplane? Like, I don't, it's just, it's different. It's just completely different. No, it is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a completely different art. I mean, it's an art I like and I, I, I admire, but it, it isn't, you can't just take your novel and, and you know, to add some little instructions and then it becomes a screenplay. It's a, you've got to almost forget, I think, the best way to adapt, not that I've done it like this, but would be to just, forget the novel exists at all. And you've got that same story in your head, but you're not writing it at all as a book and you're just trying to see it in terms of film. But yeah, it, it's, it's well, reading a book is different to watching a film, isn't it? And so writing the screenplay is different to writing a novel. Yeah. 
So uh, again, thinking about the people who listen to this, which many of them are aspiring authors, um, I always like to, to understand kind of the business side of things. So after the story is done and um, it's going to be published and, you know, that's, I mean, I don't mean to trivialize that process. It's very long and demanding. But in terms of like the marketing and the selling of it, um, you know, just talk to me about kind of switching into that mode a little bit, um, you know, when it's time to actually do the press and, and um, you know, now, now you got to start moving copies and how much of it is that stuff that, that you take on yourself and, and how much of it do you have help with and with publicists and the publisher and all that? Well, I honestly think the turning point in my career came when social media became a bigger thing. Because I got quite, I saw social media, because I've been very frustrated with my first publisher. Um, you know, they'd, pay, they'd paid me quite a, quite a nice bit of money, but then it seemed once I'd done that payment, something happens, you know, it was like two years before the book came out. And by the time the book came out, it just felt like, there's two types of publishing a book. There's publishing a book where the publisher really gets excited and gets behind it, and they really want to make it big. And then there's the, kind of publishing that's just making a book they're making a book they're distributing a book but beyond that um there wasn't much happening so I, and I, I because i had had from been writing a lot about internet marketing and marketing and that sort of stuff in my journalism i knew a little bit about it and i was quite interested in it and so when social media came on i thought well this could be a way a natural way to sort of like get my words out there get get some sort of relationship readership and obviously it took a lot of time but you know people who'd read my books or sort of like started chatting to and, and, and built it up quite organically uh, certainly among the, my British readers and um, I, I, I started to work out the sort of marketing that works and then the sort of marketing that just feels like marketing I, and and I, the, the key is just being natural, being your natural self and putting stuff out there you would put out there anyway and, and stuff like that and not not being in too sort of sales mode. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely feel like there's now I'd say it's about 50-50, like 50% of my time is spent not writing but trying to get word out about um, whatever I've pushed. And, a lot of that now, certainly from the Midnight Library, I'd say most of that comes from a publisher, not the social media stuff, but in terms of like, well, this year, it's been a year of Zoom events. Um, I've hardly left the house, but it's been, you know, it's been a, it's been a very intense book tour in some ways because of, you know, doing an event every night for sort of two weeks, but Zoom events. So, so it's like having a chat like this, but um, yeah, it's, you can see the numbers on the screen of how many people are there and if people are leaving and all of that stuff. So you, and you're seeing your own face all the time, which isn't, um, which isn't always that relaxing. Um, and yeah, I, one, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Humans and it was published in America too, but it wasn't, it wasn't, um, didn't do particularly well in America, but it was my sort of transitional book in the UK. and. I think it was transitional because I did loads of that marketing myself. And I mean, like I, I arranged my own book tour. Um, I would have probably been given about three dates um, to do by my publisher, but I, I actually made direct contact to a lot of, um, we have a book chain here, which is our sort of Barnes and Noble equivalent called Waterstones. So that's our main sort of um, book store chain and I contacted loads of their sort of regional managers and I, I, I got myself about 35 or 40 like events in bookstores around the UK and the thing is because UK is a, a fifth the size of the US in terms of population um, it's a little bit easier to sort of it's to concentrate it's almost like if you were living in California and California was the whole of the US. You, you could sort of almost yourself, you know, if you were if you were resourceful enough, go from you know, San Diego, San Francisco, um, Sacramento. You could sort of bombard the state, and like UK is almost like the size of the state. So you can actually, as as a as a writer, if you, if you've got the willpower, you can actually make quite a dent yourself on it once you're um, published. And so. Because when you do an event in a bookstore, even if like 
at that tour, you know, I, it was only like 20 people turning up for events and stuff. But that bookstore has to um, have copies of your book in for that event. So it's not about just that one hour you're doing the event. It's about um, everything around it. It's about the poster in the window before you do the event. It's about uh, any email newsletter they've sent out about the event. It's about having the books on tables in the shop. And um, so that book didn't quite become a bestseller. In the UK, my next books became bestsellers, but that book, I felt like it got me a readership that I hadn't had um, before. And I, I, I think that is down to um, that legwork I did at that point. I'm much lazier now, and I sort of do the bare minimum of what publishers want me to do. But I feel like that was important at that point that I had the sort of energy to go out there and do that. And, and I felt, I think I felt quite proud of that book. I felt like that was probably the first time I'd written a book that was truly precisely what I wanted to write. And so I thought, right, this is a book to sort of like really, uh, you know, cause it has to be the right book at the right time. And I, I thought, right, I'll go for it. Yeah. Now, as you were talking about that, it just kind of brought to mind for me, you know, either, you know, comedians who are starting out playing, you know, playing bars and small clubs before they get to the bigger venues or, even with rock bands too, you know, playing in garages and then clubs and then all of a sudden, you know, yeah. Album, third album. Yeah. Well, it's the Beatles in Hamburg in 1962. It's like doing the 10,000 shows or whatever they did. Yeah. Pete so, Best on drums before Ringo. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that was <laughs> Hamburg. <laughs> so I, I want to just kind of wrap up with, with this one thing, um, which is something I ask, uh, all of my, uh, all the authors to do, which is um, to kind of put yourself back into your younger self. So for you, maybe it's that teenager who's hanging out in the library before his, his mother and father are coming home from work and you're surrounded by those books, not really, you know, sure, or not, you know, not even thinking about making a living writing books one day. Um, so think about that, 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 you know, younger Matt, and now think about your older self and what advice would you give that younger person? Like if you could go back in time, um, I, know, I know you do have some time traveling um, in, in your background, but if you could go back in time and whisper something into that person's ear, what would it be? I would basically tell that person that they don't need to pretend to be anyone else. You know, they don't need to... Um, to, you know, success isn't trying to be someone else. I, I feel like in a way, my my whole career and my life has been a sort of long journey back to myself. And I feel like from teenage years onwards, you, you not just me, I think it's a common thing. We're, we're trying to sort of grasp other identities. We have role models that we want to be like and different things. And it's like, it's all very well, but ultimately we, we are ourselves and we, we have nothing to be ashamed of in terms of our taste in books uh you know what we want our writing style or whatever you know but early on in my writing career uh, there were so many writers that I was in awe of so many great writers but I'd end up doing karaoke versions of those writers so my advice would just be to accept myself and to appreciate myself and to approve of myself and um, I didn't have that then I, I think I'm pretty much there now, but you know, it's always a work in progress. And I feel like we, you know, we, we've all got something to offer so long as we are offering ourselves rather than trying to be something. That we're not. Right. right. And I, not to beat a dead horse, but you know, it, it's like how George Bailey had to accept himself and accept his sort of yeah. ordinary life. Um, so I think that's, that's a good one to end on. Thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed that. That was great. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt Hagg. As a reminder, his latest novel, The Midnight Library, will be released in the United States in just a few short weeks on September 29th. And if you want to learn more about Matt, visit matthag.com. If you want to learn more about me, and I hope you do, please visit mycarlin.com. That's Carlin with an O and not an I. And there's a free book offer waiting there for you. And if you enjoyed this interview, consider subscribing to Uncorking a Story wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to visit www.uncorkingastory.com. Thanks for listening.